Now, time for our interview on Sounds of the 70s. And you may have noticed Sir Paul McCartney's been back in the news recently with the big new number one Beatles single, Now and Then. This weekend also marks the 50th anniversary of an important landmark in Paul's solo career, the Wings album, Band on the Run. It was the third Wings album and was hugely successful for Paul and eventually became the best-selling record of 1974. I thought it might be a good idea to hear one of my interviews with Paul from the BBC archives. In 2009, I spoke to Paul at length about his musical life in the 70s as a solo artist and then the emergence of the band Wings. We'll hear him talk about Band on the Run a bit later in the interview. First, let's pick up on an early part of the decade when Paul and Linda moved to a remote farmhouse in Scotland. I asked Paul why they decided to get away from it all. It was so basic. The thing is, you know, I think there's a time in many people's lives when they sort of want to try things for themselves. You know, at that age, I don't know, I was sort of early 20s or mid-20s or whatever, I'd had so much done for me, you know, in the Beatles where you'd you'd get driven here, you get driven there. I mean, with the Beatles, I remember people even used to buy your Christmas tree for you. And so I just suddenly thought, you know what, those are all the pleasures in life. And so it got very kind of hippie. So it was like the uh, the Glastonbury vibe, which people, you know, are still into these days. I see young people still like that idea that you can just try and sort of, you know, sort things out for yourself. And so, yeah, me and Linda, Linda loved Scotland. She just was in in love with it. So we went up to my little place up there, a tiny little farmhouse. And we just kind of made our own way. You know, she cooked, we we did everything. We didn't have a couch in the living room, so I made it out of old potato boxes that I found, knocked them all together. What was it called now? I can't remember. It was the name of the potatoes anyway. <laughs> and I just stuck an old mattress on it, and that was how we, you know, it was fine. It was great. We were loving it. You know, we had a little new baby, and, uh, and we had Heather from Linda's previous marriage, Anyway, it was it was crazy times, but it was great for us because it was it was freedom. You know, we didn't have to uh, go into these heavy meetings anymore. We could actually take a walk in the country. We could, you know, just enjoy ourselves. We could uh, ride horses and stuff. So we had a really free time. It was beautiful. You just there was no, you know, no agenda. You could just make up your own agenda when you get up, when you go to bed. It was a really good time in our lives. I think it was very bonding. Now, why did you want Linda to be in the band? We just were, it was crazy. We were just um, sitting in bed one night and just, you know, ready to go to bed and stuff. We just started chatting. And I think I'd just seen that Johnny Cash had gone out and he'd, he'd, he was working with Carl Perkins. And I just liked the idea of Johnny just getting a few friends together and kind of going back out on the road. And I just sort of said, you know, it might be an idea to get a little band together and stuff. And I just kind of casually said to Linda, Do you, would you want to be in the band? And I think because the idea was that if she wasn't, the lifestyle that we had, which was kind of roving hippies, we wouldn't have been able to continue that. So she just looked at me and said, yeah, I suppose so. And I, I said, well, imagine, you know, you're on stage and here we go. We're starting a, a sort of a new band. Can you handle it, do you think? Do we want to do that? And so she said, yeah. So then I thought, well, you know, when we started the Beatles originally, or when I joined the Beatles, it was just some unknown people who couldn't really play. And so I had the option of either doing that again and going right back to square one with, you know, there'd be people that could play this time. But, I mean, we could play with the Beatles. But you know what I mean? People who who weren't fully-fledged professionals kind of thing. It was taking that sort of idea of just friends starting a band so we did that instead of you know the other option which would have been to form a kind of super group and ring up you know all your mates and uh, who were you know big stars and say let's do a big super group i didn't like the idea of doing that I, I quite fancied the idea of just trying to start it all over again and see what we could do so that was the beginning of wings yeah the press were not kind to, to Linda being in the band, were they? No, I mean, and I can see it, you know, because, see, the thing is, sometimes you don't think of yourself in the same way as other people think of you. So, obviously, I'd been in the Beatles, so I'd, I would be seen as some guy with a huge professional reputation. 
I didn't see it like that. I just, well, I'm just some guy, you know, I just make a bit of music and now me and Linda are getting together and we're just going to raise a family so we can do what we want, you know. And for instance, we had the kind of options of sort of going on television and explaining myself, you know, explaining ourselves, saying, this is my new wife, Linda, and I hope you like her. But we just thought, come on, we don't need to do that. So we avoided all that stuff. So they didn't really know who she was. It was just this girl who I'd married who suddenly was on keyboard with me. And they made fun of her. And, you know, let's face it, I say, you know, we knew that we were starting a group where everyone couldn't play, you know, where we were going to get it together. Unfortunately, whereas with the Beatles, we did that and made all our mistakes in private. The Beatles got booed off plenty of, plenty of places. We got pennies thrown at us and stuff. We, we picked them up, mind you. But, um, you know, so we went through a lot of that kind of stuff, but no one saw it. And I kind of like the idea of, of forming the whole thing organically again. But I suppose I forgot that everyone would be watching this time round. So, yeah, Linda took a lot of stick. But um, she eventually came through. By the time we were in America in 76, it was a pretty hot band. And she was great. When you were young. The James Bond team, live and let die. Then he decided to go out and kind of do some impromptu gigs just to turn up at a town and say, maybe we could play at the university tonight. Yeah, well, as I say, you know, we, we hit upon this idea that we would just form a group and we'd just go out, we'd play and we'd see what happened and we just wouldn't fuss about it. We'd just, you know, pretend we were a band that didn't know anything about anything. So we actually all got in a van and I was talking to Denny Seibel, who was our drummer the other day, he reminded me, you know, we got in the band, we had our kids, we had our dogs, and a van followed behind with the equipment. So this was all the band, all of us, stuffed in this one quite small van with the kids and the dogs. And we, and we just went up the motorway, and we had no idea we were going to play. And we saw this place called Ashby de la Zouche. We said, wow, that's great, that sounds great. Let's stop here. So we stopped, and then we asked someone, we said, is there a, a university around? So we thought that would be the place where there'd be people uh, that we maybe could play to. So, yeah, someone pointed us, I think it was to Nottingham University. We went along there, said to the guy in the students' union, uh, our guy said, hey, we got Paul McCartney in the van. Do you want him to play for you? So we played the next day, and that's how that tour happened. It was like a university tour. And we only had 11 songs, but we repeated some and pretended they were requests. Legend has it you got 30 quid in cash and then went off and bought some fish and chips. It's just like the good old days, really. Well, we did that, exactly, yeah. And we divvied it all up, but it was great. We just had a big bag full of coins. It always reminded us of like a Peter Sellers movie. I think it was Tom Thumb, one for you, two for me. But uh, we just divvied them up and equally in the back of the van and yeah, went and got some chips. Just last question then about the album Band on the Run. Everything seemed to be against you. you. You know, you lost your guitar player, you lost your drummer the night before you set off for Nigeria. Yeah. You were robbed while you are out there, and yet you produced one of your best ever albums. Was that because really you had to surmount all the odds that were, seemed to be against you? I think sometimes, you know, that can happen. They say that happens, you know, when you, you're really up against it. You can produce good music. And yeah, for some reason, I, well, I know exactly the reason. Was I, I got a list off EMI and said, where do you have studios in the world? And this list was like big. It was like China. And one, on the list, there was Lagos, Africa. So I just thought, wow, that sounds very exotic. Little did I realize they were just building the studio. Nobody told me that. Anyway, we sort of went off there with our just little band of folks. And it dwindled because the night before, a couple of the guys just sort of said, we're not coming. So really ended up me, Denny and Linda down there. So I did a lot of the drumming. And yet we just, we felt we had to, uh, in some ways, show them that uh, we'll show you kind of thing. We'll make a, an album, despite the odds. And yeah, it was pretty tough down there. We got a letter when we got back from the EMI saying, don't go, don't go. There's been an outbreak of cholera. So it was uh, pretty hairy. And, yeah, we did get, we got robbed at knife point and stuff in the sort of jungle road somewhere. So it was a, it was a crazy time. God. But out of it, you know, we, we just uh, focused on the music 
and we made a pretty good album in the end. How long are you going to keep touring for, Paul? Forever, Johnny. I don't mind, man. You know, it's like I mean, the rumour's gone around on this tour, like it goes around on every tour, actually, that I do these days. He says he's retiring. This is his last tour. So I keep having to say, no, I'm not. And so I love what I do. You know, I really do. I love playing and I feel very blessed to be able to do it and to still like it and not feel jaded. As of now, I'm having too good a time, you know. I'm enjoying it. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Johnny. That's Band on the Run from Wings, and I'm playing that to mark the 50th anniversary of the album's release this week back in 1973. And before that, part of an extensive chat I had with Paul McCartney for Radio 2 in 2009. And if you're a Paul McCartney fan and want to find out more about his life after the Beatles, I can recommend the book by Leslie Ann Jones, a recent guest on this programme. Her book is called Fly Away Paul. And it's got some brilliant reviews and it'll tell you lots of things you don't know about Paul McCartney.